Hi guys, it's Cliff here from Down Under. How you all doing? Well, we're heading into spring here in New Zealand finally, and it's starting to warm up at last. It's been a shocking winter. Anyway, I'm doing a run of parts in the other part of the shop, and uh, meanwhile I'm taking a few clips and thinking about another video. Um, I'm going to touch on a rapid turn, uh, production tips to do with uh, stops, in chuck stops and uh, lathe stops and also a couple of tips on Tormac maintenance. Alright. Well here's a little trick that I uh, thought of relatively recently. It took me years before the obvious occurred to me. If you've got a bunch of parts that you need all cut to the same length out of uh, diameter stock and um, for example if you're back to back machining parts in rapid turn and you want them all to be the same length there's a really easy way to use your tail stock as a stop without incurring some of the disadvantages that always put me off using it in the past if you have an extension rod in the chuck and you have a zero set on an indicator or on the dial at the back. I don't know if you can see it there, but I've got a zero on the dial. Then I can just pull the stock out of the chuck and up against that stop and then back off one turn for example. Advance the tailstock one turn again. If you have the, the handle of the tailstock handled down, weighted down, it won't shift on you, or you can lock it up here. Pull your stock out to the next part, and that way you can part off a bunch of parts very quickly and easily, and they're all the same length. Just using that reduced diameter uh, rod that, that extends the tailstock stop forward and keeps the bulk of the casting of the tail stop back out the way. So making a bunch of parts that are all exactly the same length with square ends that have been parted off from bar stock through the spindle of a manual lathe has a lot of advantages for certain types of work and is, allows you to hold the part accurately and square up against the stop within the chuck um, and, and do certain types of work much more efficiently. So um, being able to produce parts like that is a real advantage for certain types of work. And so having a tail stock with an extended rod and rotating the tail stock dial forward one turn and lining it up with a zero line means that you can then withdraw the stock out of the uh, chuck, touch it up on the stop and um, tighten up the chuck and then back off the tail stock for example one turn and, and that's a big advantage in using a tail stock for a chuck because it allows you to clear the stop away from the part so when you part it off it's not running on the, on the stop and it's not going to jam up as it cuts through and cause uh, problems or safety issues um, and then or wear the stop and then you can wind the stop forward again and repeat the procedure and get very very accurate parts and that's really useful for uh, quite a lot of production work for example when you're doing back-to-back -back machining of uh, dual parts per short piece of stock so while on the subject of stops, so that's a really good way when you've got a piece of stock through the headstock of your lathe, a long bar of stock, and you want to cut a whole lot of short pieces to the same length. And when you want the opposite situation, when you've got a whole lot of short pieces of stock and you're putting them inside the chuck, you want to stop inside the spindle then. And um, I've talked about this in other videos. So it's really worth building a uh, collar or a bush that goes inside the spindle with an adjustable rod that you can set forward to whatever length inside the spindle you need. And that way you can quickly face 
or part of a bulk of uh, a bunch of short parts. So that's the opposite type of stop coming through the spindle of the lathe. This is a sort of Mark I um, stop body. Uh, the bush just goes inside the spindle um, because there's, there's no thread in here and um, I've just got a wedge shaped piece of aluminium which is drawn in with a cap screw and it and it just expands up a slope and um, locks in place and then I can adjust the length of the stop rod with that grub screw with a soft aluminium or copper end on it. Um, but I've got a more sophisticated Mark II design if you're interested in this idea. I think it's in my uh, fourth axis uh, YouTube videos where I've got a grub screw that locks both the diameter and the sliding part. So it's a much quicker, simpler design, a Mark II adjustable stop. And of course, correspondingly, it's a great plan to have a stop in your CNC or rapid turn chuck. So you can just pop your parts in up against the stop. They're all the same length from the stop you used in the manual lathe to cut them all to length. Now you can pop them in your rapid turn and back to back machine them in pairs. So here we've got the same system of sliding stop mounted through the spindle bore of rapid turn. So back to back machining of two parts per short piece of stock allows you to machine large parts, larger diameter parts uh, than you could fit through the spindle and allows you to do work that normally could only be done with bar stock and a big lathe. I found it's a good idea to have extension pieces on your spindle stops um, so that you can have uh, a small diameter extension piece that allows you to penetrate inside a chuck for small diameter parts or large mushroom ends which allows you to give a big flat surface to sit large diameter parts against and if those parts are parted off square then they will um, help to hold the part true in the chuck. If you're just relying on the diameter of a short length, you won't get it very true. But if you're sitting up against the, the back flat surface of the stop and the part, you will get it more concentric. And um, you may want to put holes in the end if you're having trouble parting your blanks without you're having problems because there's a pip in the middle of the blank, a little lump in the middle. Then if you've got a hole in the middle of the stop, then the uh, pip will go inside the hole. While I'm running these parts, it just occurred to me a subject I've been meaning to touch on. Um, the one-shot oiler system in most machine tools usually faults after a few years and you don't get an even distribution of oil to all of the points and some of the points dry up and block up and no longer receive their lubrication. So um, particularly critical areas like the vertical um, slide and the vertical ball screw uh, can very easily become dry and coated with a uh, metal and it's, it's a real bad situation. So it's a good idea to um, have an oil can with a, uh, can you see that there? an oil can with a, a curved extension on the top. You can slip it in there and feel it touching the ball screw, clicks along the top of it and manually apply a dose of oil from time to time and also on the dovetail slides and the flat sides slides. And then as it runs with gravity that oil will migrate down through the slideways and ball nut and keep that area washed out and lubricated. Um, you might not have time to check whether or not your one-shot lubrication system is working properly in all areas, so it's not a bad idea to do a manual backup from time to time.
I can't emphasize enough the importance of manually applying additional lubricating oil to your ball screws. Um, the number of times that I've checked ball screws, you know, wiped, it, uh, wiped them with a white tissue and inspected them closely to find what looked like a perfectly clean ball screw was actually covered in fine metal particles. And you know, they're going to get into the balls and on the ball screw, the expensive ball screw and ball nut and cause rapid wear and you won't have an accurate machine for very long if you allow it to run uh, without cleaning it either manually by wiping it down with a clean tissue regularly or at least applying uh, plenty of oil to try and wash those particles off because they the ball screws look perfect from a distance but you get up close and wipe them off with a white tissue and you'll be horrified to find that very often they're covered in fine metal, metal particles and are causing rapid wear of your precious machine tool. The subject of chip breaking. If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know I've raved on at other times about the importance of being able to run your CNC machine automatically so you can go away and do something else. And an important part of running a CNC machine automatically is that you have effective trip chip breaking. If you're machining stringy materials and the chips are winding around the part into a rat's nest, uh, you can't leave it alone and get on with something else. And so what type of chip breaking tools do you use? And um, I've always I've been old school and ground mine out of high quality, high speed steel. But I think it's becoming uh, less and less common and I was curious as to how effective these modern tungsten carbide tools are that are designed for aluminium and plastic and so on. And um, so I started doing some research and looked at the forums online and talked with my colleagues that are CNC machinists and found that there's quite an argument over this. Uh, so I thought, oh well, I'll buy one and see what it's like. So I got the recommended polished top rake, high rake, tungsten carbide tool. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I've been using it for a while now and I have to say it's not as good as the high speed steel. With the high speed steel you can grind your own chip breaker to optimize chip breaking for the particular material and the particular job you're doing. Um, whereas a uh, pre-configured tungsten carbide tool is uh, a compromise. It has to be able to do both facing and turning whereas if you're grinding one you can set it up for the particular job you're doing which may be predominantly turning or predominantly facing. Um, you can set it up for the particular material, a very steep scallop for plastic for example and um, I find I have found that the high speed steel is far better for chip breaking than a off-the-shelf high rake tungsten carbide tool. So I've done some previous videos on how to grind the uh, scallop and grind a chip breaking tool. Um, don't ask me which video it is, I'd have to go back through and find it as well. So just have a bit of a look through the most likely videos and you'll find there's a couple of videos on this subject and you can grind a tool that will chip break aluminium and acetyl plastic into small chips. Look at that! There's some blue sky! Quick, take a photograph! Okay! Wraps it up guys, thanks for watching, cheers.